Hello, Hi Rock. Welcome to our daily devotional. We're continuing our exploration of the letter to the Ephesians, and Paul is going to continue today talking about this secret that has been made known, this plan that is for not only the entire creation, but has a special place in the church. And so we're in chapter 3, verse 8 through 13, where we read the following. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone the, this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. So please don't lose heart because of my trials here. I am suffering for you, so you should feel honored. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, um, Paul has you know a great, uh, really interesting history and is so fitting for this moment in the church's history. He's uh, someone who is perhaps the chief persecutor of the church and now has become its chief champion. Um, even his persecution seemed to be motivated by the same kind of racist, uh, religious prejudice that Paul is now speaking so eloquently against. Uh, if you go back into Acts, the first part person we see Paul uh, stoning to death is Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Uh, he's chasing uh, these people to places like Damascus, where uh, people like Philip, another Greek name, shows up. And earlier we saw this prejudice in, inside the church against the Greek widows, the Greek-speaking widows, and the church had to appoint seven deacons to oversee the distribution of the charity because these people were getting shortchanged. And they chose seven people who all had Greek names. In other words, this kind of racial prejudice was sort of in the air and it was affecting all kinds of people, both inside and outside the church. And so in really... I guess one way to think about it is that there was this culture war going on and the Greek Jews were seen as being on the wrong side of that fight. And, you know, they were seen as kind of diluting the, the people's blood, uh, diluting their faithfulness. It was easy to blame them for everything. And Paul was at the center of that persecution. Now, if it wasn't such a tragic affair, I, I would call this situation, this reversal actually funny because God seems to have this huge sense of humor here in taking the chief persecutor of outsiders and turning him into the chief champion of these same outsiders. And Paul is 100% on board with this shift. Verse 80 says, though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. Uh, it's like humor and justice coming together in love. Uh, but there's a higher purpose in it as as well. Uh, verse 10, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. I, I One of the things I love here is that this, this manifold wisdom of God um, in the uh, Greek, it's literally the multicolored wisdom of God. And I, I, I don't know if that was uh, an idiom at their time, but I think it's kind of fun uh, to look at it now and how uh, fitting it seems to be. But I love this verse that God's wisdom is on display to the world through the church. And I first really heard that verse. I mean, I'd read it many times, many times, but it really impacted me in a different way um, in the midst of this kind of political, uh, this political marriage of church and state that was called the moral majority, which later on became the Christian coalition. And the impact of this verse on me was not only what it said, but what it does not say. It doesn't say, you know, it, does it say God's purpose in all of this was to use the United States of America? Well, no, it doesn't say that. Does it say that God's purpose in all this was to use the Republican Party? No. To use the Democratic Party? No. God's purpose in all of this you know, whatever institution or person you want to substitute in there, the answer is going to be no. The only word that fits there is uh, the church, that God's purpose in all this was to use the church and use the church to do what? To display his wisdom, not only to the world, the world that we see, but even to the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So God's purpose, is his plan is being demonstrated and proven in the church to the world. 
And how is this being done? What is it that's proving God's plan and God's wisdom? It's this tearing down of all these barriers and making us into one humanity united in Christ. Um, I talked yesterday with uh, Pastor Kim about how, uh, you know, we, we have a church that is in many ways sort of founded by um, young adult Koreans. And now it's a church that's serving Japanese expats and, uh, you know, through the ESL ministries and the Japanese ministry. And I can't imagine seeing something like this anywhere except in the church. And it's there on full display, though many of us will never take the time to see it. You know, uh, when I came and uh, into the church and I was seeing verses like this, I wanted my life to make a difference. And, and passages like this convinced me that the real action was in the church, that God's eternal plan was being revealed and worked out through the church. And, and I wanted in on that. And so that's why I'm here today speaking with all of you uh, here with you, Dave. Dave, what do you see in this passage? Well, before I say that, I want to just pick up on, on this thing you were saying right there at the end. Um, cause you know, obviously I, I, uh, I have that same sentiment. Um, there are so many people today and this is, I'm sure has been true in every age, but I know that it's true in our age who are very cynical about the church, uh, Christians who are very cynical about the church. Um, and, and to me that feels like a little bit, like somebody trying to become my friend by making fun of my wife, right? Like the church is the bride of Christ. <clears throat> And God loves the church. And I actually think there's this call for us to love the church. And because we love it doesn't mean that then we say, oh, okay, let's, we're not going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, we're not, we're going to pretend that we don't see any, any flaws. No, no, we see them and we love enough to actually heal rather than ridicule. And, uh, and, and I see people uh, pompously rejecting the church, pompously ridiculing the church, uh, instead of tenderly loving the church, as we're going to see later in Ephesians, Jesus is, that, that's what Jesus understands his mission to be. Uh, but, you know, it's to, to give his life for her. Uh, and so there's this way that the church, first of all, is God's beloved, right? More than any one of us is. It's actually the church, this, this new humanity that we've been getting described here in, in Ephesians. That's what God loves. And that's the part that blows the mind of, of the, uh, the, the, the angels and demons who cannot imagine these kinds of barriers being overcome. They can't comprehend yet what forgiveness would even mean. And yet they're seeing it happen in front of them. And, it, you know, they just, it, it, as it says, it's, it's uh, um, to the, you know, it's, it's displaying it to the uh, unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Um, and, I guess my last comment would be totally different. Um, I think one of the real encouragements of this passage is something you were touching on in the beginning that I just think there's a little bit more amplification. I think so many of us have reasons why we are disqualified personally, why I am disqualified from certain kinds of conversations, from certain kinds of ministries, from um, you know being able to even take certain kinds of positions uh, because of my past. And so many of us are held back from doing the right thing or even following what God's call is in the present because of a way that we stumbled in the past. And if anyone had a reason to think that, it was clearly Paul. Right? Paul was a persecutor of the church. It's not just that he wasn't a Christian, that he didn't recognize what Jesus was doing at the time. No, no, no. He was killing Christians. right? And, and he, he had this like virulent anger. And as you say, I mean, he, he was a... He was a, uh, a a racist and a religious bigot, and all of—I mean, he had all of that stuff. He is the last person who has any credibility to tell people, "Hey, you need to love your enemies." In fact, you need to love people who uh, look different, people of different race, different religion. You need to love them. In one sense, yeah, he's the least qualified, and in another sense, he's actually the most credible because if he can finally see that, how can we not see it? And I think that where you see Paul, who used to kill Christians, now giving his life for the church. Paul, who used to, to hate the, the people who, who you know, uh, had a, were racially different from him, and now all of a sudden spending his life trying to reach and love and embrace them and, and, and serve them and, and see them, to, you know, finding salvation in Jesus there's a way that he has had this radical transformation. And so I think the thing that the reason I want to highlight this, I think he brings up these two things. First, 
is, man, do not ever underestimate what God can do, right? God can transform people, the last people you would ever expect, right? The one person you know it would never happen to. Yep, God can, yeah, that's easy, right? Easy. God can do it. And, and so we don't want to give up on others. We don't want to give up on ourselves because God can do a transforming work in me that I cannot do by myself. I think so many of us give up on that as well. We just kind of, we've given up on ourselves. And it's like, well, that that's nice. But it, it was, you, you're not the one who gets to make the decision in a sense. God can do incredible things. And so I think having that sense, like that belief that God can bring transformation. But then the, that last piece of it is, it's not just transformation. God can bring redemption. So it's not just the, that Paul was transformed so that he would no longer participated in his old sins. It's that, in fact, God was able to use, and this is, like I think, the most miraculous part of what God does, is that he was able to use the awful things from Paul's past. Those very things became part of the power that God was using in the present. Right? God redeemed those evil things. Doesn't mean he made those evil things good things. They were not good things. They were bad things. And God was able to use the bad things for good. And the things that you look at in your life, whatever, awful things you've done, the mistakes you've made, the opportunities you missed, the people you hurt, all of those things, those could be the source of your lifelong regret. Or they could be occasions for repentance and then an opportunity for God to bring redemption. Redemption, like actually, like, bringing value out of it. You know, you, you take an empty can and you redeem it. You get your nickel back, right? You're, you're actually getting value out of trash. God can take the trash in your life and get value out of it, right? Redeem it. I think this is the, the, the story that we see in Paul that Paul's referring to here. Because everybody knows what he did. And instead of trying to like brush it under the rug or pretend, oh yeah, that was a different guy. That was Saul, not Paul. I don't know who this Saul fellow is. What a jerk he sounds like. No, no. Paul's owning it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You all know that's me. You all know it's me. And, but in fact, that's a part of the beauty of what God does. And to him, that's part of the gospel. And I hope that all of us can see that as part of the gospel, right? Jesus uses broken people and sinful people just like us to do incredible things. Yeah, he's uh, there's a, a popular song by the well, it was a while back uh, by the script. Um, and there's a, a line in the, one of the choruses that says, Every day, every hour, turning pain into power. There, there's a mm -hmm. way in which sometimes it's our greatest failures that can finally give us the passion to do something amazing. And and if that's the case, what a better place to do that than than the church, like the place where God's heart is to put our heart into that as well. You know, and, and that's kind of what struck me about this passage in the past was like there are so many causes and institutions that that would love to have our pain become power for them. But I could think of no place that's more worthy and deserving than the church because it's the place where God's very plan is being worked out. Amen. Amen. Well, can I close this in prayer? That would be lovely. Great. Let's pray together. Lord, you never give up on us. And you can bring beauty and goodness out of even the most ugly and evil things. And so, God, we bring to you all of the brokenness in our own past, our own awful decisions, our own hurtful words and choices and actions. So many bring something beautiful out of, out of these ashes. God, we pray that you will do that in all of us, just like you did that through in, in Paul. And God, I pray that in all things, you would have all things honor you, serve your purpose, testify to your glory and grace. God, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, everyone, once again, thank you for being with us today. And I encourage you to come back tomorrow when we finally get to see Paul wrap up his prayer that began all the way back in chapter one. Go in peace. <laughs>